from 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat, eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Yes, it's not only um, the Remembrance of Sunday, but also it is the 100th uh, anniversary of the end of the First World War. Um, 15 years ago, can you believe, you know, I came here 15 years ago. <laughs> when I came to this country first time, um, it was my first experience that we uh, celebrated this uh, Remembrance of Sunday. And I thought, why we do this as Christians? And the longer I live in this country, the more I begin to understand its uh, significant historical meaning that we have to remember. I think there are two reasons that we uh, continue to commemorate this Remembrance Sunday and Day. Uh, the first one is that we have to learn lessons uh, from the past history, not to repeat the same mistakes. You know, the two great wars produced many casualties and victims and left many widows and orphans and many properties were destroyed, you know, and astronomical amount of capital was spent to rebuild the country, not only here but also other parts of the world. Secondly, we have to appreciate those who dedicated their lives for freedom and peace that we enjoy today, like your great you know, uncle. I read an article yesterday from BBC website, and it tells about something really um, remarkable thing, actually. At the outbreak of the war in 1914, the British Army had 700,000 available men on the contrary, Germany's wartime army was over 3.7 million, five times more. When a campaign for volunteers was launched, thousands answered the call to fight. Among them was, uh, were, there were 250,000 boys and young men under the age of 19. Very much moving story. Official government policy was that they had to be 18 to be signed up and 19 to fight overseas. In the early 20th century, most people didn't have their birth certificates, so it was easy to them to tell lies about their ages. In this way, 250,000 underage soldiers joined up the army, and they were deceased. And not only 250,000 boys, but also there were more than 250,000 boys under 18. Many came out and they tried to join the army, but they were turned away by the authority because of their age. Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And those who were deceased during the two great wars gave their best for freedom and peace. Therefore, we must remember them and their sacrifice. And remembering them is a kind of voluntary action. Nobody forces you to remember them and their sacrifice, but it's, an, uh, it's a voluntary action. However, in the text that we read this morning, Jesus commands us to remember him through doing the communion, Holy Communion. 
The Greek word for remembrance is anamnesia. And the word anamnesia has got its basic meaning, which is recollection. Of course, Jesus did not want us to want his disciples to forget his lessons and what he did uh, for them, especially the cross and the resurrection. However, the word anamnesia has a deeper meaning. It's, it is more than just recalling a past event to mind. When Jesus asked his disciples to remember him and what he did, he did not mean that they just recall their memories with Jesus. Jesus did not want his disciples to recollect, recollect his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave as past events. In other words, the love, of, the love and grace of Jesus that he demonstrated on, on the cross and the power of resurrection overcoming the power of death must be experienced as present realities in their lives. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, remember me through doing this. Don't just remember what I have done as past events. But those past events must be present realities in your life. And that was what Jesus meant when he said, remember me in doing this. The reason that Jesus asked us to continually repeat the Holy Communion is not to be reminded of what happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, but to help us to experience his death and resurrection as present realities. In our faith life, we do not only recollect what happened in the past, but also we make the past event a present reality. I think this is an important principle in our faith life. Think about salvation. Salvation is not only a past event, but a present reality. Those who are in Christ continue to experience salvation. You know, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, 1 verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The tense in the sentence is not just past. It is present continuous in passive voice. It says, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The process of salvation is ongoing, not only in the past, but it is ongoing so that it is a present reality as much as it is a past event. Hallelujah. We are being saved. We were saved in the past through confessing our sins and accepting him as our savior. But we are being saved continually until our salvation is completed when the Lord comes back. Think about heaven. Heaven is not only a future destination, but also a present reality. You know, many Christians, not only people in the world, but also Christians, we sacrifice our present time, which is really precious, because sometimes we are bound by our past events. We are stuck somewhere there, so we cannot live this present life. And also, sometimes we sacrifice this present time in the name of preparation for our future. We have to prepare something for our future so that we sacrifice our present time, our present life. I think both of them are not good. Kingdom of God is not only a future destination. It should be a present reality in our lives. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with the signs to be observed, nor will they say, Lo, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He said, it is here. It can be tasted. It can be experienced in your midst. I hope that we can taste the kingdom of God in our church, in our fellowship, to a certain degree. 
It's not like the heaven that we are going to enjoy forever and ever in our eternity. But to a certain degree, we want to experience and taste how the kingdom of God is like in our own fellowship in this place. Then how can we make the past event a present reality? It's a big question. It's a big question. And Michael Horton, uh, he is one of the theologians in America. He says that we need to understand remembrance, the word remembrance, in the Jewish context. In the Jewish context, remembering means participating here and now in certain defining events in the past. Can you understand it? Remembering means participating here and now in certain defining events in the past. In other words, remembrance is an active way of being part, past event into... Uh, let me say it again. Remembrance is an active way of bringing past event into present day living through participating in it. I want to give you some examples to help you uh, to understand this uh, important concept. You know about Passover. In the text, Jesus had his final Passover meal with his disciples. The most outstanding picture of God's redemption in the Old Testament is the Exodus. You know, these were people, they came out of Egypt through great help of God. And this wonderful redemption of God is memorialized in the Passover meal. Each year, every year, the Israelites would again participate in this meal to remember not only who they were, but also whose they were. I think this is really important. They participated in the Passover meal in the great redemption of God through eating the meal which provided their identity and the sense of belonging to God. Through eating uh, their Passover meal together as a family and communities, they participated in the great redemption of God, which was happened a long time ago. And that kind of participation at present time provide them their identity that they are people of God. And also, they had a great sense of belonging to God and his community. And how about the Feast of Tabernacle? You know, God commanded the Israelites, you have to make a shelter or booth to dwell in that booth and shelter for seven days when the Feast of Tabernacle came. And in that way, you do not only remember what they lived and what they did in their wilderness for, for, for 40 years, but in this way, you are participating in the great redemption of God and his guidance and protection in their lives. They dwelt in the booth for 400, 440 years. And after many years that, after the event, many years after the event, still these were lights, they practiced and participated in that particular event. In that way, they could bring the past event into their reality. In that way, they remembered what God has done in their lives. So, remembrance is not a head activity, but a body activity. You know, we think that remembrance is, is done here. We try to remember, recall, and reflect about what happened, actually. But actually, in the Hebrew context and in their meaning, it's not only mental or psychological activity, it is a body activity. Therefore, to forget is not to act. You know, to forget is not to act. You know, if we read Psalm 77, the psalmist, he cried out for help, actually, to God. When the psalmist complains, has God forgotten to be gracious? He isn't, he isn't asking if Yahweh is a bit absent-minded lately. He is wondering why God hasn't acted graciously to save them. 
It's not about you know, why God forgave me, why he doesn't remember me. It's not like a mental activity. Why he is not acting graciously to save me. You know? So whenever the Bible mentions about remembering, action is followed. For example, when the Bible says that God remembers you know, um, his covenant through seeing a rainbow, the rainbow, he actively prevents a cosmic flood from recurring. When he remembered Abraham, he brought Lord out of the catastrophe that overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah where they lived. When he remembered Ra Rachel, you know, Rachel was the wife of Jacob and she was barren. But the Bible says when he remembered Rachel, he opened her womb. So whenever the word remembrance is mentioned in the Bible, it is accompanied with actions, particular actions. So, remembrance is not like a um, mental or heavy activity, but it is action-oriented activity. Remembering is an active participation in the past event to make it a present reality. Then there is a question here. How do we remember Jesus as his disciples in this present time and you know how can we make the cross of Jesus and resurrection a present reality in our contemporary Christian life it's a big question isn't it you know this question was in my mind for several weeks actually while I was preparing this sermon how how can we make the cross of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus Christ a reality in this 21st century now here, which happened 2,000 years ago. How? It should be really, you know, active reality in our lives. We just, we do not simply remember what Jesus has done on the cross 2,000 years ago, and sometimes we are so much you know, grateful for what he has done, and sometimes we feel sad, so sorry because we do not follow him you know, in the way that he mentioned. But how can we make the two particular events, the past events, present realities in our Christian life? I cannot find the answer. So I have to stop my someone here. <laughs> I couldn't find the answer. How can I make the past event, which happened 2,000 years ago, a active, powerful reality in this present time? How can I participate in his death and resurrection? And my thoughts were being developed with the particular questions. What is the way? And I cannot find the answer apart from the sermon that we heard several weeks ago from Steve. He spoke about baptism, and baptism is the key. Baptism is the key. I'm not talking about water baptism, but I'm talking about baptism into Christ. And his sermon was based on chapter 6 in the book of Romans. And he mentioned, the book itself mentions like this, when we are baptized into Christ, we are buried, we are dead, and we are buried with Christ, and we are raised with Christ as well. So when we participate in his death and in his resurrection, we are completely united with Christ. So baptism into Christ is an inseparable relationship with Christ. How can we bring you know, the past event, death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus into this present life as a powerful active and reality? Only the concept of baptism. Not water baptism, but complete unity and union with Jesus Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit. And that is the only way 
to participate in his death and in his resurrection and to remember him, to make it present reality today, now here. If we die, if we die with Christ, and if we, we have got the, the, the power of life of Jesus Christ through his resurrection, I think we will be different. We will be different. We must be different. As a church, we must be different. We may not feel we are feeble, or we are weak, or we are vulnerable. I'm not talking about you know, any kind of just triumphalism. You know, the Bible doesn't say that we have to have victory, but the Bible says we have to overcome evil. So we participating in the death of Jesus and resurrection, we will be overcome, whatever it is which is against us. We must die with Christ. And this is the true way to remember him. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And how can we remember him? Through dying with him. Through participating in his death. Through baptism that we heard from the book of Romans and from Steve. Through baptism. Through dying together with him. Through being raised again in his resurrection. We can remember him. Paul said, I die every day. He was not talking about his physical death, as we know. He had only one life. He was talking about his spiritual death with Christ every day. I think he was not concerned about what was going to be happening in the other city when he traveled. But actually, in his mind, actually, maybe he was concerned about his spiritual status whether he was with God or not, whether he was still being baptized into Christ or not. We shouldn't worry about what is going to be happening in our future. But we have to be worried at present time about, am I being baptized with Christ? Have I been dead with Christ? Have I been raised with Christ in his resurrection? He said, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If we are able to confess this one in a true manner, in our true spiritual conviction that the one who is living within me is Christ, not me, then what is the problem with us? What is the problem with us? If Christ is living within me, He is leading me, guiding me, He is, you know, taking me through different journeys. What do we have to be concerned and worried? What is the meaning that we died in Christ and He is living, Christ is living within us? It is about total submission, isn't it? Total submission and total surrendering. Lord, I'm nothing but you are everything. Have your way in my life. But still, I find myself that I command him, Lord, you have to do this one today for me. You have to send my son to a good school that I'm praying for. You know? I find this, all the self living within me. My struggle is, with, is not with my you know, difficult situations that I've, I'm facing. But my struggle is with my old self. As, as Paul confessed in chapter 7 you know, Romans. I want to do this one, but you know, there is something powerful in me which is driving me to the other direction. I do not know what to do. What a wretched man I am. But if we die, in the way if we participate in his death, in the way we remember him who died on the cross for us, then there will be no problem actually in our lives. Total submission means dying with Christ, denying myself and denying my idea, denying anything from me and just simply follow what Christ says to us. 
only Christ commands us and we listen and we do. And you know, um, the apostles you know, who wrote different epistles in the New Testament, they had their own particular identity in relation to their relationship with Jesus Christ. And every single person, they mentioned themselves as a servant of God. It's not like a servant that we understand nowadays. As you, as you know, uh, the, word, the Greek word for servant is doulos. Doulos was not servant, but slave. The low, lowest grade in the slavery system, doulos, couldn't open, couldn't open their mouth at all, couldn't express their thought at all, just standing. And whenever the master commands, they have to understand and, and do not only the thing that they were told, more than what they were told. And that was life of Dulles. And they lived in that way. They were directed by the Spirit of God. And they dedicated their lives. They were martyred. Maybe gladly. Maybe fearfully. But they dedicated their lives. They didn't have any idea to choose what they want to do. God, Jesus spoke to Peter. In the past, you went wherever you want to go. But from now on, you will be dragged. You know? And Peter lived in that way. You know the story, Corvatis Domine. You know, Peter was coming out, coming out of Rome to escape from persecution in Rome. And on the way, he met Christ. It's not written in the Bible anyway. <laughs> and Christ said, where are you? Uh, uh, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? The Lord said, I'm going to Rome where you are escaping from. And Peter changed his direction. And he went into Rome. And he was crucified. Not in the way that Christ was crucified, but upside down. He was upside down when he was crucified. In that way, they lived their lives as true slaves of Jesus. And that was evidence that they died in Christ. And they remembered Jesus in that way. Do we remember him? In our lives, do we remember him in this way? And we must die with Christ. And we must know that we carry the life of Jesus in us. I do not want us to undermine who we are in Christ. Not only in our, not in our own um, ability or experience or knowledge or capability, but in Christ. We have to know who we are in Christ. We are, yes, from, our, from the worldly perspective, we are like fragile jars or vessels. We are like clay jars. We are so fragile. If somebody drops us, then we are just broken. And that is what the Bible says, actually. You are like a clay fragile jars or vessels. But don't forget, in that clay fragile jars, you carry the treasure, who is Jesus Christ. So life of God, life of Jesus, from the power of resurrection is in you. You are this much important person. You are this much powerful person. If you truly remember Jesus Christ and his resurrection, if you participate in his resurrection, you are not only a clay jar fragile, you are carrying the life of Jesus Christ in you. It's not my word. It is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you have got the power of Jesus Christ in remembering his resurrection, then it's just like this. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. Okay, it doesn't say that you will be okay. You will be fine. You will be protected. No, the Bible never says that we are protected from anything. We may be pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. And this is God's protection. This is the power of God and life of Jesus Christ in us through resurrection. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may be also in our bodies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are perplexed, 
but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but not abandoned by God. Not because of me or because of our ability, but as we remember the resurrection of power, resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has the power of life in us, it enables us to overcome what kind of, whatever it is, troubles or difficulties in our lives. So today is the Remembrance Sunday. And we have to remember our master, Jesus Christ. Not only those people who were deceased in the first and second war. It is important for us to remember them. But we have to remember who Jesus is, what he has done in the way that the Bible mentions. And Jesus meant, let's die with Christ. And let's remember all the time that we carry the life of Jesus within us so that we have the power to overcome any challenges in our lives in the world. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you, Father, for inviting us not only to be saved, but also to be baptized into Jesus Christ so that we are united with him through his death and through his resurrection. Lord, help us to crucify our sinful nature with its passion and desire to die every day. In that way, we want to remember Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, help us to, to be reminded of the fact that we carry the life of Jesus in us. The power of life through the resurrection of Jesus is within us, Lord. So, although we are struggling with many uh, our challenges and troubles and difficulties in our lives. Lord, we thank you, Father, because we are not crushed. We are not abandoned. We are not driven to despair. And we are not dis destroyed because of the power of Jesus Christ as we remember him and his resurrection. Father, we thank you. And help us to taste the kingdom of God in this place as we worship together, as we serve one another, as we fellowship together and pray for one another and support one another. Lord, be glorified in our church, in our lives. And have your way, have your initiative in this place. We want to listen to what you say for the future of this church and we want to obey whatever you say to us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.